director here at HELP, and I want to welcome everyone who's in the room. It's great to see um, a bunch of new faces um, at a, a HELP talk, so welcome, everyone. Um, we run HELP talks every, hopefully every month, sometimes it's every second month, depending on the content that we have. And the purpose of these sessions are to reflect on a topic of interest that we have, an area of research, um, to dwell on it and think quite broadly about different aspects of that topic, and um, hear from people from outside at HELP as well who are reflecting on the same kinds of issues. So today, really, the topic is community systems. Um, for a while now, <clears throat> Brenda has been leading up some research for us here at HELP that was trying to get at that question that we heard a lot when we went out into communities to talk to them about how their children were doing using the EDI and MDI, and that is, well, what can we do differently? What, what's going on in communities that might help us explain some of the differences that we see in child development outcomes? There's many answers to th that, that question, but one of the answers that Brenda is really digging at is, what are the community systems and networks answers that may lie underneath some of the differences in child outcomes that we see across the province? So Brenda's lined up a really beautiful series of presentations. She'll start off with a little summary of her research. Um, I believe then John and Alan will provide some insight into some amazing work that they've been doing here um, with Vancouver Coastal, Vancouver Coastal primarily? Fraser as well. Fraser. Um, and then Joanne Schroeder, who most of you will know because she is well known here at HELP, is going to talk about her work in the Comox recently um, as one of the leads around building an early child years, an early child center, an early years center, or a system in the Comox Valley. So she'll talk a lot about the collaborative that they're building there. So really scaling all the way from research to practice. And then we'll leave time at the end. It'll be my job to try and pull the threads of those three presentations together. And we'll leave as much time as we possibly can for questions, discussions, so that you can dig a little bit deeper into each of the presentations. So Brenda, away we go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. As, as Kippa said, it's nice to see so many um, familiar faces that come to help talk all the time and also new faces. And I also want to thank um, our we have people that are joining from Northern Health Authority as well. Uh, this is the first Help Talks, I believe, um, where we've tried to do a webinar, um, or we are doing a webinar. So um, really, <laughs> hopefully it's not just a try. So um, thanks so much for all of you who are joining remotely. Um, it's just wonderful um, that you're able to participate. Um, as Pippa mentioned, um, the focus of the research uh, today is really about community systems and looking at interorganizational collaboration in particular um, as one of those spheres of influence that may impact healthy child development. Um, I've been at HELP um, since I was a postdoc and Clyde Hertzman was my um, mentor, he was my postdoctoral supervisor, and as long as I can remember since those days, um, um, one of the factors that, or some of the factors that Clyde used to mention were related to the importance of intersectoral leadership and relationships with um, municipal and regional leaders as being critical. So relationships as um, key for understanding um, differences in vulnerability and ways to promote healthy child development. So that's really uh, the thread um, of and the inspiration for uh, the work that we've been initiating over the last um, year or so. Um, also, it fits very well within um, our theoretical model that we use here at HELP, which is related to the bioecosocial influences on healthy child development, so drawing a lot from Bronfman Brenner. Um, and this really fitting within that community uh, level sphere of in influence and in particular looking at um, early childhood um, services and programs um, as being a major factor as well. So um, as Pippa mentioned, this is a little bit of a roadmap for this morning. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of emerging findings from some of our research regarding um, interorganizational collaboration, particularly within the context of early years tables and early child development coalitions. Um, and then next, we'll be moving into really digging into um, trying to understand interorganizational collaboration with a complex dynamic systems lens, um, and thinking about that also with um, regard to interorganizational collaboration. So uh, looking to, to Alan's presentation in particular to, to guide us in terms of the systems lens, and also in relation to, to thinking about how we move research to action, um, and ways that we can link concepts and theories with what happening on the ground with communities. So the research to action and the link with what's on the ground 
really linking with what Joanne is going to talk about, which I'm really excited about. So um, just a logistical thing is you might notice um, I'm tied to the uh, computer today, so I won't be walking around, or none of us will be walking around too much as we're doing our presentation. So um, I, when I mentioned that to Joanne, I just have to laugh. Joanne, with Joanne's response was, I guess, something about not being able to do a dance or a jig <laughs> alongside our presentations today. Maybe at the break. Maybe at the break, yeah. <laughs> so um, that's the reason why we're, we're going to be sitting today. Um, so, just a little bit of an overview um, of where this coming, where this work is coming from in terms of a theoretical lens. Um, we, we've known that community coalitions have become a really popular and entrenched strategy for health promotion. Um, and just to be clear, in terms of what we mean by community coalitions, it means small groups of individuals who have joined forces to address um, local problems um, or health or social concerns. And what we've done is drawn from um, Butterfoss and Keebler's work on their community coalition action theory. Um, and I won't walk through this in a lot of detail, but looking at the understanding of the community context and its influence on having um, a coalition form, a lead agency uh, sort of playing a key role in uh, organizations coming together um, to address certain problems, concerns in their community, um, and thinking about it in terms of particular structures and processes, um, ways of understanding leadership, and ways that all of this con contributes to collaborative synergy, um, and ways that members will engage within that coalition, and ways that they will pool their resources, non-financial and financial. All of this collaborative synergy being central to informing uh, ways that that coalition or table is able to assess and plan um, action in relationship to its needs, and in turn ways that will will implement strategies. So that could be related to service delivery as well. Um, those having an influence on community change outcomes, and then in turn also having an impact on community capacity. And ultimately, hidden here is health and social outcomes as the ultimate. Um, outcome that we see that um, could be um, related to looking at these collaborative structures. Um, also in, on the bottom here is this idea of coalitions um, not being static but forming over time. So a period of formation, uh, maintenance, and then eventual institutional, institutionalization as well. So this has been a guiding framework for us in how we've designed um, our study and also in, in um, thinking about um, theories of change. Uh, we've used it as really a strong basis for one of our provincial evaluation projects of the provincial office for the early years, the BC early year centers. Um, so I think we've just flipped it a bit, but really uh, the essence of it is very much drawn from this particular theory. We've drawn from community coalition action theory, but another lens has been um, thinking about uh, collaboration and what collaboration means, what meaningful collaboration means. So we've drawn from existing literature to think about collaboration in terms of a continuum, um, where at one end of the continuum it can reflect organizations at the far left um, at that co coexistence stage who really really barely relate to one another, um, even when there's a problem or issue that extends beyond what they can do on their own, um, to sort of what you'd see in the middle, which is where organizations may share information and start to coordinate activities, but then uh, really uh, and, and we're leading to another um, end point here, which is more related to transformation. Um, and that's not necessarily just information sharing and coordinating activities, it's about um, merging roles, responsibilities, and capabilities. And the way that we've drawn from this theory is try to, and we've moved it along, I think, in the last um, year or so, too, is thinking about it in terms of different dimensions. So collaboration is having multiple dimensions, including those related to um, the importance of quality of trust and um, the quality of trust and the relationship itself. Um, the level of interaction and engagement that happens, that can be on a spectrum from very frequent to very infrequent. Um, looking at magnitude and type of resources that are available, as I mentioned, the non-financial and the financial. And the scope of activities that are planned and implemented, whether the activities are very narrow or whether they're really broad. And then finally, thinking about collaboration in terms of the organizational change that can happen. So what, can, what kind of change or transformation can happen as a result of that collaborative process? So what is our approach? Well, our approach is um, to gather and analyze data in relationship to our uh, primary study objective. So our study objective is to study community coalition initiatives, particularly in relation to the early years. 
um, in relationship to the structure of people or groups involved, so who's involved um, at the table. Uh, thinking about processes and functioning, so thinking about decision making, for example, um, leadership processes, um, and outcome products. So interested in looking, thinking about community change outcomes. So what's happening um, at the local level um, that's, that seems to be making a difference um, for children and families. What we're doing is uh, we're using a multiple case study approach uh, with mixed methods. So um, uh, we're doing in-depth face-to-face interviews with um, the vast majority of coalition members in selected communities in BC. And um, we're also doing, uh, we're also provide, uh, doing a coalition survey with them. So each participant is, is asked to fill out online a survey that really talks in detail about their interactions that they're having with one another. Uh, and that's really to get a sense of that, that idea of network. So the social network is being a really key lens for how we're looking at this information. Um, and um, with that, um, just briefly, our approach to analysis is social network analysis um, to analyze that network data. Uh, the interview data, we're using a consensus qualitative research approach, so really um, having a team approach to uh, domaining and abstracting our audio tape transcribed data um, and having an audit as well, so really having a lot of check-ins um, and a consensus document for each one of our interviews. Um, and then finally, within our case study, looking within and across cases. So if each case is a community case, we not only need to look within the community for key domains and abstracts, but also looking across, and that will be ultimately what we will do in the final stages. All of this information would cool to help us understand um, and incorporate into our statistical models. Um, things like the differences that, as we say here, differences that make a difference, uh, trying to understand um, to what extent some of our community level factors are contributing to some of the variation that we're seeing in our uh, population level data. And then importantly for us is also integrating and applying that knowledge. So being able to integrate knowledge into um, thinking about quality improvement, about ongoing evaluation, and also about eventually hopefully designing an intervention as well um, that can promote maybe greater collaborative synergy and some community capacity building as well. So just to share with you a few initial findings um, from our work. Uh, I'd like to show you just a, a community case example. And some of this will be familiar if you were at our expo. So if it overlaps, it won't all be um, familiar, but we had an expo a few weeks ago. And so um, some of this information will be what I presented that day as well. But um, what I thought I'd do is just share with you um, a little bit what, what's emerging and draw from one of our communities in particular. So we purposely selected communities that um, differ on their uh, EDI vulnerability rates. So we have those that have been consistently a low vulnerability and those that have been consistently on the higher end. Um, thanks. Thanks so much. So um, here we see that there's uh, a range of agencies and organizations in this particular community. Um, and this has been one way that we're trying to represent a range of services um, and a way to also consider um, with communities um, ways that these agencies and organizations as a collective may be meeting or perhaps not meeting the needs of the particular community. Um, so that was our first step, is really just mapping out um, through these social maps what could be happening. What we did next is we wanted to ask the organizations, um, so this is where we interviewed each one of the members of this uh, table, to tell us about the frequency of collaboration uh, that's happening. And so for here, this, this involved um, basically summarizing the ties that each organization had with the other in the group. And so you'll see the degree there really represents the number of ties that a particular organization had with others. Um, so then we can see here that, for example, the highest, oops, this around. You see the highest in, uh, where do we go here? So the Community Child Care Resource and Referral has the highest degree in that it has um, the most ties to other members of this network. And we also see public health, interestingly, as another group that um, is on the high end of, of um, this level of degree. And then you see a range all the way down to low, where, for example, a library is less connected with other members of the group. So what happens is that I take all of this data, um, the degree data, and this is where I incorporate the social network analysis. 
And this is just a way to map out some of those degrees, so some of those ties, um, in terms of what's happening. How are these organizations um, across sectors, disciplines, how are they collaborating? Um, and in this case, uh, I've highlighted in green the areas, the size matters in this case. So uh, the size indicating where we're seeing um, the most uh, ties. And then those with the, that are smaller are on the periphery and those where they're less connected with the group. And this is that heart-shaped structure in the center. And we can do a number of things with this. And one of the things of interest is looking at density. Um, in this case, I've also looked at something called centralization. And centralization is interesting because it's a way of thinking about how um, connected um, certain groups are to resources. So it can be a way to understand how certain members may have al 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 um, uh, access to different resources and also in turn some um, power as well. So this is one way that we've looked at subgroups and thinking about uh, clusters or cliques. So we call them a network analysis. Um, and also thinking about, again, that idea of centrality, who may be in the more advantaged positions, who may have more access to resources as a whole. Um, where could there be um, bridges that are happening? So sometimes there are bridges that are, play a key role because they play the go, sort of the go-between role between different agencies. So sometimes those in between roles can be can hold a lot of power actually in that case and um, this could be interesting because we can see that perhaps the power that we see within these structures is something that can be pervasive um, and the inequities that we're so interested in understanding that help how can these collaborative structures if they're in if there are inequities in here or their power um, issues here how can they be impacting some of what we see out in the community as well uh, the, oh sorry very um, go ahead, yeah. So to this particular like mapping out these different resource, uh, people, resources that represent, is it hand-drawn or, or does a program actually create that for you? No, I, yeah, I wish I could take credit for doing that. No, no, it's, it's uh, software. So I use UCINet. I use UCINet for this. And, um, and that's what helps me also look at density and things like this too. So this is where I, I look at centralization. Um, and centralization here is where you can look at how um, some of the power is distributed. So um, here the centralization was 51%, showing that there's a moderate level um, of, of centralization happening. Um, and we would see a, we would see 100% if this was a totally um, centralized network. So if some of you are at Expo, you might have seen that I showed a star structure where there was uh, an organization at the very center and there was a wheel coming out of it showing that that particular organization was, it was a, that was a very centralized structure. That's probably what you'd say is the most, the ultimate um, in showing a, a, a centralized network and where you can see a concentration of, of potentially power. Um, and so in this case, we don't see that same star, strip, star structure, um, but we still see this clustering that's happening. And that clustering still shows that there um, is the possibility for differential access to different types of resources, differential access to um, power as well. And that's why we're seeing um, a moderately high uh, centralization percentage of 51%. But as much as the ties are of interest um, and the density of interest, um, we're also interested in the outcomes. So look, thinking about our theory that I showed you, the Community Co Coalition Action Theory, um, one, of those, one of those aspects of interest was uh, <laughs> <laughs> implement. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. It's live, live thing. <laughs> um, one of the things that's of great interest is also not thinking about collaboration for collaboration's sake, but thinking about what are the outcomes of collaboration. So how does collaboration result in or lead to improved service delivery. And that's where we're really interested in looking at theories of service integration. And here we've drawn again from um, theories that look at service integration at a continuum. Um, and thinking about service integration, just again about the definitions, about bringing together separate and independent services that were apart before into something that's more of a comprehensive service delivery system. And it's a way that um, communities are trying to resolve issues of silos and dupl duplication, fragmentation, and service delivery. Um, and we've identified a number of different components related to 
to service integration, but um, I won't go into, into them here, but just to say that um, this piece of thinking about collaboration, not just as the end goal, um, but also as something that's, um, that's important in thinking about um, um, improved service delivery in the form of service integration. And just as um, one aside that I didn't mention before, too, and thinking about the theories and how um, coalition action is related to the ultimate outcome that I pointed out in the, the diagram at the beginning. Um, what's the evidence base for that? Is there evidence to actually show that the coalitions have any impact on healthy development? or health, and the evidence is really mixed. So, um, and it's mixed, sometimes they're finding, yes, there are, of course, there are outcomes, and sometimes it's, there are problematic um, issues with the research itself. So there are methodological issues, I think, in terms of inconsistency um, in the way that um, they're measuring um, different aspects of collaboration and, and coalition action, structures, processes, and outcomes. So that's definitely a concern. So, um, just to say that um, there's more definitely to be done in this area. Um, and this is one small way, I guess, that we hope to dig more into the early years. Um, along the line of thinking of um, functions of uh, or collaboration, not just as an end result, um, it's really thinking about what the, what the purpose is for these coalitions to come together. And um, is one of the functions, one of the functions that we identified in the study was looking at information sharing. So to what extent are organizations sharing information with each other? And you can see here that there's a lot of consistency um, in really relative or in comparison to the other diagrams that I showed you, the other networks that I showed you. Meaning that there's a lot of information sharing and it seems to be happening across organizations. So there seems to be an equal amount of information sharing with a few exceptions. What happens if we look at something else? Like if we think about, if I go back here to our service coordination and integration section, um, one of the important things that we've highlighted here is that we see that the collaborative continuum that I showed you before really is the foundation for this service integration network. So the service integration continuum too. So we see that information sharing, for example, would be something that could be a key part of this phase of coordinated service delivery. So if organizations want to coordinate with each other, then information sharing is a key activity associated with their collaboration. But if they want to move along to something along the lines of joint service delivery and integrated service delivery, it takes much more in terms of some joint action, um, pooling of resources, um, more in terms of um, of, of coming together uh, with a common um, common ground, common system for thinking about referrals uh, and, and service delivery and so on. So thinking about different um, activities, the different types of activities is one of the things that we're interested in. So if we view information sharing as one type of activity, um, what happens when we think of information sharing and joint program delivery. So if we think of joint program delivery as maybe something a little bit deeper in the collaboration side of things. Um, it's beyond just sort of um, a networking table. We heard this from the early years evaluation that we're conducting. Many of the tables want to are saying in order for transformation to occur, they need to be go beyond just sharing information with each other. They can't just be like a networking table or uh, a place where you just have a round table and then it ends there. Um, what the communities are saying is that there needs to be something beyond that. And so joint program delivery is another strand. So what I did here was try to understand um, not only what's happening in terms of joint program delivery, but what's happening in terms of the strength of the ties between agencies? And one way that we can look at the strength of the ties is looking at the aspect of what's being done. So as I mentioned, information sharing versus joint program delivery. Or, and also, we can look at combined. Do we see collaboration as stronger when we have just a single a single tie or single way that they're connecting, let's say it's just information sharing, versus if they have three ways that they're collaborating with each other, then that reflects a stronger tie. So this is an example where I've pulled out what they refer to, what's referred to as multiplexity. So thinking about how ties reflect multiple or multiple um, functions in this case. Um, so here we've highlighted, I have highlighted in green. So all areas where you see both the ties where there's both information sharing happening 
and also joint program delivery. So you can see that this network is not as dense as the information sharing, and there's quite a bit more diversity here. So information sharing seems to be something that's happening. Um, but, to this, but also there's still a fair amount of of dual processes, dual functions that are happening here. Um, and what will really come out, I think, will be interesting is because this is one this is one community. So when we do our comparative case study analysis, then we can see relative to the other communities um, that are varying in their developmental vulnerability, for example, whether we are seeing any variation in terms of multiplexity, um, in terms of the types of ways that people are collaborating together. Oh, sure. Thanks. Hey, Anna. This is a low EDI vulnerability community. That's what's happening now. <laughs> yeah, it's all in process. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, that's the part I think I'm just so eager to, to try and get there uh, to see how we're going to see, you know, whether we're going to see differences. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to close off today and I want to be able to turn it to Alan. Um, but really, the next steps are um, in terms of practical implications. Uh, we'll be wanting to engage with different early years community tables about some of what we're learning. So I think the potential is there that we can show some of the maps, so these social maps that we're developing, and talk to communities about um, what do they see, what are they happening, do, what's happening here, do they see gaps, um, areas to strengthen, are there levers that we could build upon, um, are there ties that could be um, potentially strengthened that are sort of more on the periphery or more on the weekend um, than what they see currently. So I think there's some potential there um, in being able to talk to communities about this. Um, and, and talk about some of the specifics around structures and processes. Uh, the research implications are we will continue to investigate um, the structures, processes, and outcomes of different, um, uh, different coalitions in different contexts, as you know. So I'll be sharing findings, I'm sure, in the future about what we see in the other communities. Um, just thanks, everyone, um, for um, coming again today. And I do, do just want to acknowledge our funders for these projects. There's two complementary intersecting projects um, that this relates to, uh, one from the Institute for Health System Transformation and Sustainability, and then the BC Office for the Early Years supports our uh, early years evaluation work. So um, that is uh, my piece. And um, I don't know. We're kind of short on time, so maybe I'll hold the. Maybe we could hold the questions if till the. Any questions, just immediate questions. Why yeah. Don't take them just the, is there a yeah. pressing question around redness? Byron. In terms of the mixed uh, evidence, in terms of uh, some of this work, in terms of the outcomes, mm -hmm. um, is centralization a bad thing or a good thing or? It, it's, it can de I think it depends. It depends on the context because you can have a centralized network that, for example, that one, where there's collaboration happening at a core that can create efficiencies actually in action. And so in this case, it's a task where it's actually very inefficient for a, a every agency to connect with every other agency at the same level. Um, so you could argue that centrality um, in terms of a cluster like that, where we see a broad range of organizations who are working together on on common goals as as being a strength and something that can help move move their initiative forward. Yeah. So, so I have a question. I mean, that there's lots of answers to it elsewhere, and just would be happy to be pointed elsewhere. I was curious that when we were looking, showing the um, the maps of the interactions, and we mm -hmm. look at the, yeah, right there, for example, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if um, you've explored or plan to explore the characteristics of those organizations and how, okay. Yes, you definitely. Done that or? Yes, yeah. So we've, uh, what, what I would do is I would tie into this the attributes of the organizations. Right. So I could put in things like um, type of organization, like the type of service they provide, and also like things like length of time they've been in the community. So I can tie in all of those attributes and actually subdivide this um, at a later stage. Size, different. budget, exactly. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have budget information, I don't think. But yeah, what the, the information that I have available, for sure, then I would be able to piece in that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so why don't we 
move on and then we will have time at the end to reflect a little bit more on Brenda's in the context of the two other presentations. So Brenda's work is really thinking about some of the structures in communities and the process that happens when, when, when organizations do or don't collaborate. The next presentation by Alan Best and John Miller is really going to focus on what are the different ways of thinking that need to emerge underneath strong collaborative structures that help us get to um, improved practice. Um, so Alan and John, I believe you're both going to speak. Yeah, Great. I'll do the most of it, but uh, okay. John's agreed to pop up when we're talking about his project and he'll answer all the tough questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we choose to go with a somewhat whimsical metaphor as a way to start thinking about this. Um, the dancing part you already know. You've heard a lot of it from uh, Brenda. It's always true when we're working in communities that getting the different organizations to work together effectively is going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. The Russian dolls part, I wanted to say a little bit more. Increasingly in our work, what we're finding is that we really need to pay a lot of attention to the way that organizations are embedded within communities, are embedded within the provinces, are embedded within larger structures because those externalities have a huge effect mm -hmm. on what a community can and cannot do. So that's why the Russian doll metaphor. Um, you're going to be getting a lot of information today, I feel. I think Bern has already overloaded us a little bit, and I'm going to try to make it much worse. Um, so just say now that uh, we're hoping that we continue dancing with you, too, because very much have a similar vision for where we want to go with this kind of work. Um, John and Carol Herbert, who's out of town and couldn't join us today, all collaborated on this project. But we worked together with the InSource Research Group, and I'll say more about that. Uh, happy to share the slides, happy to have continuing conversations. You can email us. So let's make this a, an exciting dance. OK, I'll talk a little bit about who we are. I want to talk a little bit about how complex systems are fundamentally different than the way we usually think about organizations, structures, and, and a lot of the research and the work we do. Um, to start to explore whether there are simple rules that we can surface that generally will hold true when we're talking about strengthening community systems. And then finally, hopes get some discussion going around what are some of the next steps that we might want to work on together. We started this work um, around 2000 with major funding from CIHR around community partnership research. And it was largely in a research group that's embedded at the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, collaborating with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, but other health authorities very much too. So we started with a mandate of looking at how we might improve integration and outcomes using research as part of that process. Uh, very quickly, naturally, found that Partnering was going to be a big part of that, and we had to understand more the kind of things we're talking about today around how do we partner with the different organizations. But quickly, we started to pick up knowledge exchange, systems thinking, transdisciplinarity as other areas which are huge areas in and of their own right, and I'll come back and talk about that more, that we needed to understand and to weave together if we were going to be effective. The problem was that we were finding that the bridges between the ivory tower and the real world tended to run in parallel. They didn't actually connect with each other. What we wanted to see instead was something like the London Bridge in the 1600s, where people uh, work together, live together, go to church together. And it's that kind of how do we create that kind of close collaboration that's going to be the challenge for a lot of what we do. These are the in-source research associates at this point. What we did towards the end of our first 10 years was to realize that increasingly having to rely exclusively on CIHR funding got in the way of doing the things that were most useful to the health authorities. Uh, we, we decided that it just wasn't good enough, formed a consulting group that could work directly with end users of the research, still continue to do grant-funded research, but felt this blended funding model was going to be important. And these are the six senior associates that we currently have working with us. Some of them you may know. Um, I can tell you that they're all troublemakers. Uh, we, we have a shared passion for wanting to make the health system work better. Uh, none of us are in regular salaried kind of positions with the exception of Trish Greenhall at Oxford, so that really we're free to do and say anything we want. And we think that puts us in a position where we can start to really be more effective in applying some of the systems thinking to some of the priority needs in the health system. So how are complex systems different? 
there is no universal definition of what we mean by systems thinking, but this gives you a sense of it from Senge, who started writing about this stuff in the 90s and where it started to become really avant-garde in the private sector. It's taken a while to get into the public sector. But generally, it's seen systems as being organic, dynamic, nonlinear, not capable of being understood with reductionist thinking, can't use command and control kind of practices to run them. That's a different world. Uh, it requires a continuous learning and adaptation. And because we see research as the cornerstone that we're going to start from, it becomes a question of, well, how can we use that knowledge base that we're generating and start to see it better integrated in these kinds of complexity processes? Quick summary, again, of some of the significant factors that really do make complex systems fundamentally different from what's merely complicated, something like sending a man to the moon. I mean, we can do that. We can engineer it. We can't engineer this kind of work. And it's, it's so fundamentally different in terms of taking a different kind of a, an empowerment approach, letting things happen much more rather than trying to control them, uh, continuous learning, continuous evaluation. So it really becomes something where we need to realize that we're going to have to rethink a lot of the ways that we work, including the way we do our research, if we're going to be constructive in this kind of an environment. Back to the Russian dolls. Uh, this slide is from a recent project that we did with the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. They were, the ministry was rolling out 11 different clinical guidelines, mainly in hospitals, saying this is evidence-based, this is the best way to do things. Uh, it wasn't going as smoothly as we might have liked. So our mission was to try to understand what some of the barriers and the facilitators to implementation of evidence-based guidelines are. We did that. But along the way, what we really came to understand deeply was that everybody in the room wasn't talking the same language. In fact, they weren't even in the same room. And that there were a host of organizations which were somewhat political, including the ministry and the clinical care management project itself and patients and politicians and doctors of BC. And, and all those groups had a finger in the pie. Uh, there was another much more complicated group than you might think that was supposed to be running this thing at the executive level, all the different folks running from the executive team and the board right down some of the project leads. And then there were the people who were actually supposed to be doing this stuff. They didn't talk to each other. They lived in different worlds. There were different priorities. And so it's that kind of complexity that's like Russian dolls, if you will, of smaller dolls living with larger dolls living with larger dolls and how critical it will be to understand some of these dynamics if we're going to have an impact at the community level. Okay, simple rules for uh, strengthening community systems. Well, let me start by talking about some of the specific projects we've been working on. I'm not going to have simple answers. Uh, there aren't any. Um, but we can start to at least think about some of the principles that seem to emerge from the different projects we do. Uh, Brenda used uh, network analysis a lot in her presentation. We do a lot of that too. But I'm going to be primarily focusing on another systems thinking tool. Concept mapping is something that we find particularly useful at the very early stages to get all the different stakeholders on the same page using a common language and logic to think about the problem that they'll work together on. So the first project we did was for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. They were rolling out a primary prevention initiative, a uh, really large thing that would require collaborators across provinces to be working together on common initiatives. Um, what we did for them was a pre-meeting concept map and then a series of two-day meetings that would bring together different perspectives on prevention and get them to think through what the concept mapping meant and how they would put it into practice. Then CLASP, this initiative, would fund coalitions and knowledge exchange meetings and get things rolling over what was initially a five-year funding and has now been extended. We start with a concept mapping focus and ask all 500 of those folks, so what are specific actions that we can take in Canada that would increase the prevention of cancer and other major chronic diseases that sh should include? So not directly relevant to early childhood stuff. We know that if we backed up far enough, it would be, but um, mostly people who are much more looking at chronic disease in adults, they'd brainstorm. We got a total of almost 500 different ideas that people brainstormed on the web. An expert group reduces that to something around 100 that's more manageable by combining the common ones, and then puts it back out to people to tell us how important they are, how easy it will be to implement, 
You put it through a complex multivariate analysis, and this is what you end up with. This is kind of the core of the methodology. It's looking at, in this case, I think it's 11 different factors. An effective community strategy will need to include all of these. So you're going to have to form partnerships. You're going to have to align their efforts. You're going to have to think through what's the government's role. You're going to have to develop some healthy public policy. All those different things are going to be included if we're going to have a comprehensive strategy. And you need to be doing them all and thinking about the synergies amongst them. The methodology also lets you do some very useful kinds of things. What you're seeing here is a comparison of the rankings of the importance and feasibility of these different groups. You can see that what's important is not necessarily what's feasible. You can also do this to compare and contrast different groups. For example, we had another map that looked at how do researchers see the world and how do people in the real world see it. Um, not the same. <laughs> Second example I want to introduce for you is from uh, work we did in Saskatchewan. They were getting a variety of what they called large system transformation initiatives on the go, including improving primary care, reducing wait lists, um, making things more uh, patient-centered, and so on. Um, and they realized that all these were truly transformative. They were going to have to change the way professions work together. They're going to have to change their funding models. They didn't know how to change of systems. So they asked us to do a rapid review of the literature to synthesize what was known. Uh, they started with the assumption that culture change was going to be the backbone, if you will, of this whole initiative. And they thought they knew something about the kinds of things that were important for that. Um, but we needed to really spell that out. What we did was to use an adapted realist review methodology that allows us to take the kind of systematic review that normally takes one to two years and to do it in, in this case, less than six months. Uh, we do it in part by involving a variety of different groups that allow us to move more quickly. So that, for example, we'll get an expert team of people who are actually publishing this research in the web. And we'll get them to collaborate with us with a structured approach of telling us weekly, you know, is this the best way to frame the question? Where are the key articles from your opinion? So it lets you move much more quickly when you're moving hand in hand with the people. We also have reference panels so that from the get-go, we've got a group of people who are going to be the end users of this that we're staying connected to throughout so that they can guide us in terms of how do you frame the question? How do you look at the literature and ways that are going to be helpful for them? At the end, what we did was put together what we called a learning forum of some hundred people in 10 different countries, all of which were who were doing this kind of system change in one way or another, and ask them to both validate our findings by rating how much that was consistent with their experience, got really high consensus, so that there was good consensus on what the literature was saying and what we were finding. Interesting, we invited them to share their personal experiences and got over 100 pages of qualitative transcript, and then we weighed our way through. <laughs> Um, the synthesis process, when you start looking at it, doesn't look all that different than the way a normal systematic review would look, except that we're using these groups to good effect throughout. I'm going to move quickly on some of this stuff. I know more quickly than you'd like to see the detail, but I'll send you the slides if you're happy to, okay? With the Saskatchewan project, what we ended up is thinking that we'd identified five simple rules for how you go about doing large system transformation. The first was that you had to have a mix of top-down, bottom-up distributed leadership. The innovation is really going to come from the bottom. You need to have the other levels in the system being supportive and facilitative and resourcing that innovation. But the leadership needs to be distributed through the whole system. If it's going to be effective, you have to have effective feedback and reporting systems built in. So those feedback loops are constantly telling you how you're doing, what's working, what's not, and so on. Historical context is really important. You have to link to what's been good in that province in the past. In Saskatchewan, it was easy. They had a long history of being real innovators around the health system, and we're happy because of that culture of innovation to move on some fairly boundary-pushing kinds of things. That won't always be true, but what was clear from the literature is you, you had to link strongly to that context in the literature, saying that simple rules will emerge partly for that context, from what's worked for them in the past. Engagement and empower is a no-brainer. The literature says that it's particularly important to engage with doctors. Uh, we got some pushback from the other disciplines when we put that out there. Uh, but for sure, engagement with the different disciplinary groups, 
trying to get at some of the power issues that are getting in the way of facilitative transformation, getting to the public, the literature says are critical, and that it has to be person-centered. At the end of the day, it always has to come back to the triple aim and how are we going to make things better for the patients, for the system. We next moved on to a project for Saskatchewan that wanted to look at this key role of culture. So again, with CIHR funding, um, this time with a full year of funding from uh, Knowledge Translation Committee to work more collaboratively with the stakeholders at the senior levels throughout the province and doing this review and bringing it forward. It's two questions, how we could sustain culture if they're able to initiate it, how will they keep it going in the long run, that kind of a process model for a coalition development that you talked about, Brenda. Mm -hmm. And then how are we going to assess that culture and understand the role that it plays. We ended up with that study identifying some six guiding principles, all of which were going to be important for sustaining change. A lot of them are similar to the, what we saw in the last study, but they're different. It's a different question. Somewhat different things come out of the literature. I'm not going to spend much time on that. I'll just give you a second to look at it. And some of these we'll come back to with the other examples, particularly things like relationships really start to come out more and more as being a critical factor that's never given enough attention or enough resourcing. Mm -hmm. The fourth example is a project that John's been doing in Langley. John, can you take over on this one? <coughs> yep. Just do a sound check with the audience. Do they pick me here? Okay, good. <clears throat> so this is a project in, in Langley that's a trans, meant to be a transformative project. I mean, I think the problem that we're addressing, I'm pretty well aware of all the deficiencies in the current primary health care system. There's problems of access, continuity, quality, et cetera, et cetera. So it was meant to take the uh, uh, complex adaptive systems approach to transforming primary health care in a given community. This community was selected because they already we already knew they had a lot of going for them, and particularly in what you're talking about, Brenda, with uh, an existing coalition that, that was already up and running. So we thought we could go to them. We could add all the people there that we could, we could talk to. So the idea was to was to uh, apply some of these principles uh, that we've talked, that Alan's touched on and you've touched on. First of all, in complex adaptive systems, where you're trying to make change, there has to be a vision. Fortunately, in healthcare, we've had this triple aim vision that I'm sure everybody who's here is familiar with, but if not, number one is improving the health of the population and reducing inequities in health of the population. Number two is improving the patient experience. And number three is controlling the costs, trying to reduce costs. So that, that was developed by Don Berwick in the States, that's been picked up all over the world, and it's the vision driving the ministry, the health authority, and in this case, the community. You've got to have leadership, distributed leadership, as Alan has said. You've got to have grassroots leadership, and you really need leadership at the top in the health authority and in the ministry. You need networks, and you need these trusting relationships that both of you have come back to, and, and uh, that's absolutely key. And 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 addressing inequities in power relationships, as you touched on, Brenda, as well. And then always the principle being. We're using the best available evidence. We're never going to have perfect evidence or the final scientific answer. You've got to take the best available evidence for what's out there and move ahead, taking risks and risking failure. And there's tools like network analysis and concept mapping that we've already talked about. Understanding that the whole point here is to move towards creating a, an organization that is self-organizing. And, and out of which will there will be emergent solutions that we may not have even dreamed of, that we can't predict it. It's non-linear, non-predicted. So it's a whole process of trying to identify what the simple rules are for promoting this self-organizing behavior that will go in the direction we think we want it to go. So it's a bit loosey-goosey and not quite my, my uh, original uh, command and control culture for me personally. Being a doctor, it's really hard for John. Being, <laughs> being a doctor, you know, you're used to that. You tell people what to do, right? So um, it's it's a very different paradigm. The next slide, please. Sorry. So um, 
what are the simple rules for self-organizing change in primary health care? Fortunately, there is a vast literature that people have already mined and done the work uh, before I came along. So the, the list here uh, goes through two slides. There's six principles, six rules, if you like. First of all, you have to have a geographically defined population. These rules, by the way, are being applied in spades down in the states through the accountable care organizations. And, and they're certainly um, in use. And I'm glad Northern's on the call because a lot of this is happening up north much more than it is down here in the lower end of the province. Second thing is you've got to have integrate. You've talked about moving from coalitions to integrated provision of care. So that's what we're talking about. You ultimately want to have inter integrated interprofessional teams that, that include family practitioners, nurse practitioners, public health, pharmacists, physios, navigators, home care, long-term care, mental health addiction, specialists, hospitals, community supports, brackets, early childhood development, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, uh, social work, the on it goes. So the challenge is how do you move towards creating truly integrated interprofessional teams that cover this grand gamut that in the third rule is it's comprehensive. So it starts right upstream with prevention and the social determinants of health. So you've got to address issues of income, early childhood development, education, housing, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things have got to be in the, considered to be within the mandate of this organization. Primary care through the physicians and, and nurse practitioners and others. Specialist care, hospital care, home care, long-term care, all these have to be, so it goes right through from upstream income poverty issues right through to the end of life, palliative end of life care. The next one, please. And then the fourth one is having finances. You've got to have resources to do this. Um, you've got to finance the information systems. People have already stressed the importance of flows of information and feedback loops. None of this is going to happen unless we have really effective databases and feedback loops. So you've got to fund that. And you've got to fund the change process. Without, without resources, you can't get change. And then the fifth is what I've already touched on, interoperative electronic health data systems. And uh, whoops, we timed out. Uh, and and C, CQI, continuous quality improvement systems. You've got to have data, clinical data, and financial data for all these uh, professionals in the system, feeding it back to them so that they can learn from what they are actually achieving, not just what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what are the outcomes? So they know, are they getting getting better results or not? And there has to be an accountability function. Again, the, the sixth principle here is some mechanism for patient, patient engagement is the buzzword, but we're, I don't think of limiting this to patients. This is citizens and community engagement. We've got to engage the community and the citizens in the community, including people who've had direct experience of clinical care. In a governance mechanism, this is something we don't have. I, I haven't even heard that up north where they're so progressive that they have solved this problem. I'm hoping we'll hear more about that if they have. But this is, this is totally missing as a governance mechanism at a community level, actually. Uh, gather the data, report to the community, and then hear back from the community so that you can, if you're trying to transform the system, the fundamental idea here is, is co-design. You're co-designing it with that community. And it's probably going to vary from one community to another. Clearly, a top-down command and control process probably is not going to be very effective. But if you can actually create a system at the local level where the community is engaged with the providers and redesigning it to address the barriers and make achieve the vision, then you're, you're likely to get that. And the key leverage points that have already emerged from our study in Langley are these three. Getting the data through an interoperative electronic health record, which we're miles away from. I can't even believe it's going to happen in my lifetime, which is getting shorter and shorter. Um, um, and resources with it, they're, everybody's financially strapped. Fraser Health is underwater. The ministry is always struggling. Uh, are we going to get the resources to achieve this? I, who knows? Can we get community engagement? There's huge, it's unbelievable the resistance to this idea of getting community engagement. This is handing power over to the community. Well, this is, we're dealing with a culture in the health authorities where the power resides with the executive. And they don't want to give it up. So we've got big cultural challenges. So. So those are the those are the six principles. 
we're struggling with it. We we've at least know where the barriers are, and we're beginning to think about how we might go another step to get past the problems with this one. But it lined up beautifully, Brenda, with what you outlined as the some of the, the ways to go. And I'm sure there's mutual learnings we can have trying to struggle with what we're doing in healthcare with what you're doing in 30 years. Thanks, John. Okay, the fifth example is from a project that CIHR funded out of the University of Waterloo Propelled Center for Population Health Impact. Barb Riley and Cameron Willers are the leads on it. And what they're wanting to do is to start from the understanding that while we know these networks are important, we don't actually know very much about how to strengthen them. And that what this study was designed to do using concept mapping was to explore what outcomes are seen by these bridging networking organizations in terms of trying to improve their effectiveness. So again, using concept mapping, um, in this case a small number of participants from various chronic disease prevention networks across Canada, asking the question, what's a meaningful measure of network outcomes? Um, they generated 82 unique statements. They were sorted into different piles and, and then run through this normal cluster analysis to come up with these nine different clusters. Now, if let's think about this slide for just a minute. Um, the bottom five clusters are largely issues that relate intermediate network outcomes, enhanced learning, improved user resources, greater cohesion, and so on. The top three are more the impact, long-term effects of the network, such as improved population health and improved system performance. The one in the middle, we've labeled uh, improved intersectoral engagement. I'm not at all clear what that really means, but it seems to be the glue that's holding this thing together. Uh, okay, yeah, we probably need something like that, but it, it was pretty messy in the mapping. Um, so just a few observations in terms of the, the kinds of things that trouble me seeing these data. So it's really starting to think about, okay, this is helpful, but now what? What are you going to do with it? Uh, the first thing that bothered me was that leadership and power are missing as key factors. Duh. I don't know why. They were asked, participants were asked about outcomes, and maybe they saw those too much as process things mm -hmm. and didn't talk about them for that reason, but... It's a bit of a mystery and certainly something that's been left out of the equation if we were wanting to move forward with this process. The second thing that bothered me is this centralized integrative function of intersectoral engagement was rated relatively unimportant. It was the least important of the factors. Well, again, it makes no sense. So it's something about the process where the data that we're getting aren't the whole story and we need to be starting to think about how can we use these more quote, rigorous kinds of tools that have a lot going for them with other kinds of processes to better, deep, more deeply understand the dynamics at the community level, right? This is a cross-sectional snapshot of how the people in the community see at this particular point. It's not dynamic. It doesn't really capture how things are going to change, and tomorrow it's going to be different. So how do we start to move from this static model to a more dynamic understanding of the processes that communities engage with when they're trying to do it well? Any governance approach, John's been highlighting how important this is going to be, is going to have to be fit for purpose and fit for context. This probably does a reasonable job of starting us thinking about purpose. It does nothing about context. It's not explaining what's unique about this community, what makes its, its dynamics different than others, and how is that going to affect this kind of general model. And then finally, the question you asked earlier about Brenda's is, what are, how tight should a network be? And most of the network scholars these saying, saying it needs to be a paradoxical blending. There needs to be real strength at the center that tries to coordinate the things to be coordinated. And it needs to have loose peripheries that allow networks to engage and do their own thing and get creative. And it's that delicate balance of tight enough but not too tight that networks need to strive towards. So we're starting to see, and as Brenda certainly highlighted, just how complex this network development, network improvement process is going to be. And that's certainly, if there's one area where I hope that we might work together, it's us really being driven 
by what's happening in the community, you being able to rigorously look at that, mm -hmm. and hopefully we can find a middle ground to continue to work together. Okay, I'm gonna slow down. I've got five minutes left, right? Yep. Maybe a question or two. I think we're on. I think we're on pace. It's not too bad. So this is a uh, a thinking tunnel. It's outside Brodie Castle in Scotland. And a couple of centuries ago, people actually used to build these lovely places you can go and think. So we're going to do that for a few minutes. <laughs> The first is to think about the different paths through complexity. It's this tight, loose thing we're starting to talk about. So clearly, we need to have a large self-organizing function. We just let the communities do what they do. And we need to legitimize that. We need to make sure that people have the time and the resources and the opportunities to do it well. We have to be responsible for making sure there are good, strong feedback loops so that people can learn as they go. And it really needs to be a platform for shared learning, shared development within the community. Those things should be self-organizing to a large extent. We need to resource them and support them, but we need to let them go. There are things that we need to do centrally that produce, improve some of the dynamic integration. We, we need a theoretical model. Leaders need to model the kind of leadership that they want. Uh, it needs to be multi-level, as been talking about. Uh, there needs to be an orchestration function somewhere. So most of the network research, for example, talks about a network administrative office. Again, good questions about what that should look like, but you need to have this kind of facilitative coordinating body. There needs to be transparency and accountability to all those centralized functions. Yeah? Okay. Across several projects, this is what is starting to feel like to us. We're starting to feel that there are four cornerstones to building a system transformation that we consistently find. One is a clear knowledge to action kind of a framework. The second is this understanding of networks that we're talking about today. We do a lot of work around leadership and it's really clear that, that needs to be reinvented, if you will, that a lot of the current problems we're having in changing the system are because the style of leadership, the way it's structured and implemented, just isn't doing the job in terms of what we need for system transformation. And then finally, this big community engagement piece. Around this, I've started to position some of the factors that consistently come out in terms of focusing on the incentives, looking at the relationships, making sure there's continuous learning. All those things are processes that seem to be woven through and cut across these four colors that we need to attend to. So this is just a mind map for me, uh, something I tried to put down on paper to try to get a handle on what were some of the common elements we were starting to see. It's not validated. I'm not sure it ever will be quite this form, but it's useful, I think, to think about it this way. So what's the emerging wisdom? Well, clearly we need to enhance network integration. And as John's suggesting, I think that's going to call for a pretty creative governance model that really starts to allow for much stronger working on the relationships amongst the members of the network. Usually these networks lack any clarity around roles, responsibilities, decision-making, accountability. You, you can't change the system like that. It's, it's organic's fine, but up to a point. And then you have to do something a little bit more. So we're starting to think about that as the more the network gains strength, the more it becomes like a meta-organization, if you will, that needs good governance, resource alignment, accountability, and so on. The accountability tends to be, as we know, top-down, rigid, imposed on top of service functions. Not going to work. How can the priority for innovation and learning be blended with that kind of top-down pressure that the system experiences? In complex systems, power tends to be particularly influential, but less transparent. It's really what's driving or getting in the way of change but we don't talk about it. It's the elephant in the room. And how do we get past that and start to deal with it more effectively? How can we dance, if not with each other, than with the 800-pound gorilla? Now, it may not be practical to think that all the key stakeholders are going to formally sign off on a 10-year MOU. 
memorandum of understanding. It's going to specify the resource allocations and the operational responsibilities. But I think we need to think that way. We at least need to have those conversations and get all the different community partners thinking about, well, if we were to get married and to formally commit ourselves to working together on this over 10 years, what might that look like? Um, and it's only when we start to get that kind of shared vision and commitment that we're going to see the kind of collaboration that we need. Okay, next steps. I've highlighted some of the things that are broadly true in Canada and they give us a leg up. And internationally, we're seen as particularly well blessed because of these things. Uh, the strong collaborative culture in general, a lip service to complexity at least, a recognition that there is a need for transformation. We are seen as world leaders in terms of how we think about the knowledge to action process. Uh, but there has been weak federal provincial collaboration. Justin's going to change that next week. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we really have a, and with all the, the, the major studies that have been coming out as of late show this how often the dysfunctional MD fee for service model is getting in the way. It's almost universally the bad guy in the room that's getting in the way of doing this kind of transformal work. And we're going to have to solve that somehow. What's unique about BC? That's where we need to move, start thinking about. What's particular about our context, where are the opportunities, where are the barriers going to be, what are going to be some of the indicators for partnership performance and system transformation that we could be working on together? We're going to need them for sure. Might there be new models of research collaboration? Um, we're certainly talking to the Michael Smith and to CHR about how can you be more responsive to the end user's needs? How can we weave that into the whole process? And, and finally, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what would it take to do prospective comparative case studies? Um, we've had a few international meetings around this in the last few years. Um, Robert Wood Johnson in the States started talking about this language of prospective comparative case studies, meaning what you're going to do is get communities to start with common measures. They don't have to be common interventions. Every community is going to be doing its own thing. But if we get enough of those that have the common measures over time, then we're taking out all that variance that's normally in these kinds of comparisons and we're in a much stronger position to start learning about it. So we're actually thinking that prospective comparative case studies across jurisdictions, across problems, are going to be the right methodology moving forward. Some of our more medically inclined colleagues may have to shift a little. But uh, we think that's going to be the way forward. So thank you. Again, glad to share the slides. Just email me. Hope we'll continue the conversation. Can I just ask <laughs> when, you, when you were talking about leadership and you said uh, the current leadership model is not adequate, I'm just wondering, can you expand on that? I mean, I, mean, I know there's a need for distributed leadership, yeah. but, but where some of the... Um, happily, I don't have to do that. Uh, one of our colleagues, Hugh McLeod, who you saw a picture of at the beginning, has just finished a stint, uh, s six years of CEO of the uh, patients, Canadian Patient Safety Institute, mm -hmm. and he also was co-chair of the on the board for the Canadian Health Leadership Network. So in that context, there's been a whole lot of thinking about leadership and what it should look like. Mm -hmm. Hughes published a series of 65 commentaries and published by Longwoods as kind of on a weekly basis. Um, we were funded to do systematic syntheses of the first two in the series um, so that I can send you those syntheses, which are probably as good a way as any. You don't have to read all 65. Um, <laughs> but what's intriguing is that Hughes series has had a quarter million hits. I mean, I, I don't understand a quarter million hits. Uh, we were at a, I was at a meeting of the, the school faculty uh, last Friday, mm -hmm. and they were talking about uh, the need for peer-reviewed work as an important part of demonstrating your connection to the school. Um, Hugh doesn't have a lot of peer-reviewed stuff in the traditional sense. I kind of feel that a quarter million hits from your peers is peer-reviewed. <laughs> um, so 
it's really, it's clearly, we're again living in two separate worlds, but he's really talking about a lot of these issues around distributed leaders, empowerment, walking the talk, showing what's necessary, uh, creating the resources, creating the opportunities. I'll send you the papers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to take a break. One of the beautiful things about these sessions is we have a little bit of a break in the middle so people can meet, um, talk a little bit about what they've heard so far. So we'll take a break until, I think we'll go till 11, pick 20 minutes. Um, and then Joanne is going to talk about what this really means when you actually start to try and do it on the ground. Great. There's coffee and cookies over here.
Hello, hello, hello. We can hear you. We can hear you. We are live. I haven't heard it before. What time do we have till? 11.30? No, and we have until about 5 to 12. Oh, so great. Right. Questions oh, yeah. and answers at the end. I know. You're okay. <laughs> so this morning we heard um, a lot about research, the concepts and ideas that are underpinning a lot of really important work that's happening in this province around transforming our systems and thinking about that from the bottom up um, using collaborative and networked approaches. Um, Joanne Schroeder, many of you will know, used to be the Deputy Director of Health, is now the Executive Director of the Comox Valley Health Development Center, um, and is leading up work there to build a collaborative early years structure in the Comox Valley, um, and has been on, on this work for about a year and a half, and so I think some really important lessons are emerging from Joanne's experience, and the beautiful thing is, because Joanne is embedded in a lot of the research that we do and the thinking that was, was talked about this morning, she's very intentional about some of what she's doing. So um, it's going to be great to reflect a little bit on some of the practice and how much harder it is when you actually get out there and try and make it happen. And I know that so many of things, the things that Joanne will talk about were actually in themes that emerged in, in the, the earlier part of our presentation. So, Take it away, and then we'll have um, a great chance for discussion at the end. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Pippa. Really great to be here. Um, thank you to Alan and John and Brenda. My brain was just spinning as you guys were talking to think about the applicability of some of those things um, to the work that uh, we're doing in the Comox Valley. As Pippa said, I, I've had lots of years of thinking about um, community collaborative efforts and systems change. And it's nice that you're here, John, because I don't know if you remember, but 26 years ago, um, <laughs> 26 years ago, I was a trying to move away from a career as a child protection social worker. And I was given a job by a guy by the name of Chris Haynes on Vancouver Island to um, work with the Regional Child and Youth Committee, of which you were a member, and then uh, to work with all of the communities around Vancouver Island to build these new collaborative structures called Child and Youth Committees. So uh, those ensuing 26 years, I have been engaged um, in a different kind of way in terms of visiting communities to uh, sort of hopefully infuse a bit of knowledge um, and to, certainly to learn from the things that communities have been doing around the province and across the country and whatnot. But uh, it's only over the last uh, now nearly 18 months where I've been immersed in trying to do this work in one community. and. Uh, as the title says, uh, way harder than I thought. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And it just was really um, struck me this morning as both Brenda and Alan and John were presenting the commonalities across these things, which gives me a lot of hope because it, it really does say there are some key areas where we can focus to really be effective in our work. How did I make this go, Maddie? Oh, there it is. So uh, I actually went back and looked at some of the, the presentations that uh, we used to do uh, here at HELP. Um, and this slide comes specifically from one uh, from September of 2009. Um, I could have found uh, these same things in many other places, and I probably could have found it uh, earlier than 2009. But uh, for many years, um, we were thinking about uh, what were the lessons um, learned in terms of what was making a difference for communities uh, where we thought they were sort of trumping uh, some of the socioeconomic determinants of, of childhood outcomes. And um, Clyde, in his brilliance, was able to uh, articulate uh, these things that we then went and talked about in terms of needing to focus on research, very much that it was making a difference to have the strong intersectoral leadership, partnership, advocacy, uh, plan for addressing barriers, and the important alignment with school system. So I probably talked about this slide 
more than 500 times um, in terms of going around and talking to communities and people would people would nod and people it really resonated with people that these were the things that we were uh, needing to do. But in hindsight, we are beginning to realize that this was too simple um, of an approach for people and that we really needed to unpack um, what those things meant in terms of how people behaved differently, how people thought differently, and really starting to put um, more of a complex uh, systems lens on and all of these lessons learned. So I find it really um, affirming that these lessons are still the pillars that they are, but really needing to, uh, to dig in a little deeper. I always have to put this slide in every presentation I do because it's just a reminder that we have to think differently all the time um, about how we approach things. That is a picture of the Comox Glacier. Um, if you invite me back again, I'll show you the picture of the glacier today, which is much smaller, and we'll have a help talks on climate change. But <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> it is much smaller than that now. That's a bit of an old picture. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that we have been um, learning in our work there. Just to give a little bit more background, so um, when I returned to the Comox Valley, a um, couple of things happened uh, at the time that I returned. One was that the Comox Valley was designated as in one of the initial pilot sites to be an early years center. Um, and then the other was the, the success by six coordinator who had been, as you can see from this uh, diagram, the, the real heart of um, much of the collaborative work um, that had gone on uh, left that position. He's now here in his new provincial role. Identify yourself, <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> um, and so there was an, another new person in a leadership position um, in the community. And this is a diagram of the work that was being done around early years collaboration at the time. And um, as you can see, there were an, a number of smaller groups that rather than being focused on broad, the broad earlier system, were more focused on specific aspects of the work. So you may not be able to read that, but there was a father involvement group. There was a school district early learning committee. There was a perinatal committee, the parenting committee, a family literacy committee. So there were really more like working groups um, rather than sort of a, a coherent strategic approach. And I really want to emphasize that there was a lot of good work um, that was going on uh, in these groups. A lot of very effective projects, a lot of positive touch on the lives of children and families um, in the Comox Valley. But the only thing that knitted them together was Joseph in the role of Success by Six coordinator. And it really did not allow for any of the kinds of things around distributed um, leadership, organizational processes, uh, broad relationships that would create uh, some structural advances um, in the community. So coming new to the community, we decided that we would see if there was a way um, that we could do some things differently. Um, the Early Years Center really acted as a catalyst to the community wanting to make change. And that, that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, all the Early Years Centers in the province get $52,000. Um, $52,000 is not enough to change the world. Um, we should all have a bumper sticker that says that, I think. Um, but even that little bit of provincial money was a catalyst for folks to rethink how they were doing things. Um, we really started from the beginning about thinking of the early year center as not a center or any kind of new service, but as an opportunity to integrate process and practice um, across services. Um, I think it was really unfortunate that the provincial initiative was called the early year center because it, 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 it 
portrays that it is actually a building with new services. So we've really tried to work um, against that. Um, it has been really helpful and a great catalyst for the community to be part of a renewed provincial network of communities and, and the provincial office of the early years has played an important role in terms of facilitating that shared learning. It kind of gives credibility to um, the partnership work uh, that was already going on. And importantly, at least in our model around the early years center, it has required us to make some uh, formal collective governance and um, partnership agreements across organizations. So this is now our um, new Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative um, that has reformed from the previous slide. One thing that I think we importantly learned here was that while we were forming the collaborative, we were also working on a new strategic plan, a new early year strategic plan in our community. And I think having that focus for our collective work, rather than just getting together and talking about what would be the terms of reference, who would be involved, all of those kinds of things that all of you have been involved in processes that just, you know, sink uh, around that. So we were doing the work while we were forming the new structure. Hopefully what you see there is um, that the notion of the collaborative was that it would include uh, and build from all of the uh, existing work in the community. So it really was designed to incorporate all of those existing groups, although they don't meet distinctly any longer. Uh, but we met, part of the process was going myself and the new Success by Six coordinator to all of those groups, talking about our vision, talking about how they might see themselves uh, within that, and celebrating the work that they had all done and incorporating it. So the only groups that are continuing to meet um, within that are the perinatal committee and the Aboriginal Council for Early Child Development. Um, importantly, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, um, we have a new uh, leadership team. So in the middle, you'll see the Comox Valley Early Years leadership team, which has uh, engaged a whole bunch of new people who hadn't previously been involved. Plus, you'll see that we've also expanded the circle to include parents and interested citizens and other folks that hadn't had a way to participate. This is what the collaborative does. Uh, it only meets three to four times for, uh, per year. And you can see in the bottom bullet there uh, what the group does. Um, uh, in those meetings. So it really is sort of the overarching. You got a question, Barry? Go ahead. I do. But, but do you have, like, continue, do continuous learning when you only meet three or four times a year? Well, it's a, it's a really good it's a really good question. And one of the things that we've been struggling with or exploring is how we do do that. And um, because the leadership team is meeting monthly, and the idea is that there they have some accountability to keep that continuous learning going within their own organizations, but there has been some some struggles with that. Um, so, and we we um, originally envisioned that the collaborative would only meet twice a year, and we got lots of pushback about that. So now we've gone up to the four times per year, and um, that two of those will be. Um, shared professional development sessions um, cross-sectorally. So this is all pretty new, so we're seeing, yeah. This is a leadership team. Um, so very much what I have learned over my years of working with communities is that you won't make structural advances without having uh, organizational leaders around the table. And they have not traditionally been around uh, the early years tables. The early years collaborative work has very much been driven by uh, frontline um, folks. And so recognizing that this was sort of the primary purpose of the reorganization uh, was to add the leadership team. And one of the key things that we've done with this group, which I'm feeling optimistic about, is we've um, established a community 
uh, early years fund. So um, a number of the pots of money in the community that go to early years, so our success by six funding, our um, family literacy funding, we have some raise a reader dollars, the school district has some money for early years. Those, that's all being held now by the school district um, without administrative costs that will then allocate those funds based on our strategic priorities in the community and we won't have any competitive process uh, for those funds. So that's been a big uh, change and we're just practicing it with relatively small pots of money but the idea is if we have success with that we'll be able to do it with all of the early years resources um, in the community. Sorry, Joanne, did you say you will or will not have competitive process? Sorry? You will or will not have a competitive process? We will not. We will not. Yeah. So the idea is that the group will get together and say, okay, looking at our strategic priorities, this is where we want these monies to go. Mm -hmm. so. And it's the leadership team that makes that assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, although we, you know, we have built in this notion that the leadership team is always accountable to the collaborative. So, and we haven't quite figured out how that works on a day-to-day basis. Um, um, oh, I heard my question. We have, as I said, been working on this collaborative strategic plan and, and have just um, launched that. Just tell you a little bit about the process that we did with the strategic plan. And again, a really good learning for me in terms of having um, many times over the years been involved with a strategic planning process where someone visits the community, spends a day or maybe two days to facilitate uh, a strategic plan. And we made the decision that we were going to facilitate that um, ourselves and did it over uh, a period of months, had various people involved with the facilitation of different aspects of it. So you can see there um, what we did over the period um, of a year. It was really um, important, I think, that third bullet around finding our heart um, because that was an opportunity for uh, some of the folks that hadn't been around the table before to come together in some sort of shared um, visioning. Um, and this may come up again in the presentation, but one of the things that has been my most profound learning, I think, is that particularly in the early childhood world, uh, people are not going to accept organizational leadership uh, just because they're the bosses or they're the senior people. Um, if they they want to see that people are committed to the, the cause that has you know been so central to the frontline folks for so many so many years. So how do you actually um, get share that passion? Uh, you know we joke about it. You know everybody has to get together and hold hands and sing kumbaya. Um, and but it is a little bit of that. It is a little bit of um, really wanting to see it differently. Go ahead, John. John, can you just say a little bit about what is the shared passion? What is the vision here? What is, what's the problematic? What's the vision? So, so the vision is, I mean, ultimately about improving child development outcomes. Um, and so it is about, you know, all children having access to quality environments is basically um, where we're going with, with the vision. So that's, um, and so understanding inherent to that is understanding what a quality environment is, uh, what are the kinds of experience that we believe are in children's interests, all of those pieces of it. And having a shared idea of how we're going to get there too, right? So it's not just the vision, but the shared theory of change. Um, we have just had the uh, strategic plan signed off by everybody involved. And now, as it says, the hardest part, which will start next Monday at our next leadership team meeting um, to create the working groups, make a plan for each of the strategic priorities um, moving forward. This is a little bit of the sort of idea that we've been trying to uh, get at in terms of the system. And um, there's sort of two big pieces to it. One is the service integration work that is the work of the earlier center. I'm going to get somebody at help to fix the slide up for me while I'm here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy? Um, <laughs> and, um, 
and that has been the work of our early year center coordinator uh, and that really is about we have a model in the community called every door is the right door and um, we've done a lot of shared training uh, we stole the idea of every door is the right door from Chilliwack where they have been doing a similar process in their community but the idea is that rather than integrating services ever under one roof which would not be very family friendly is that we our community is a virtual roof and that any access point for the earlier services will give access um, to all of the services in the community so it's actually been very exciting because the model includes um, every elementary school in the community as an early years satellite center um, we've done training with a team from each school, which includes the secretary, the kindergarten teacher, a strong start facilitator, and the principal. So really wanting to infuse uh, these ideas throughout the organization. Um, then we also have satellites at Aboriginal Head Start, Public Health, uh, our Military Family Resource Center, Child Care Resource and Referral. So really trying to have this idea that uh, there are multiple access points uh, in the community and that people share um, a commitment to increasing the accessibility of services for people. Um, and then one of the big questions that has been around the province since the early years centers have been introduced is how do they relate to the existing uh, collaborative work that has been led by Success by Six and Children First in the province. And so we've tried to show how those things are distinct but connected. And so the work of the Success by Six coordinator is more around the public education awareness, um, advocacy certainly, promoting healthy built environment, those kinds of civic, what I call civic engagement kinds of pieces. But the work of all of those folks is guided by the leadership structure, uh, involves um, establishing organizational partnerships, being driven by the strategic plan, etc. cetera. Um, and then the intent will be that we'll evaluate our impact and come back again. So better hurry up just a little bit. So some of the things that I think that um, I've started to try to think about because, you know, a lot of the time my head really hurts in terms of where we're going with this and I get very confused and um, so to have a way to kind of lift my head out of the clouds now and then is good for the kinds of things to think about. Um, just want to make a comment about top down and bottom up and, you know, mostly what I'm talking about today is bottom up because that's what, I'm, that's what I'm living at the moment. But I just want to acknowledge the important impact of the top down and that we know that um, if there isn't more of a provincial framework, some regional governance, that, it's going, that, that our efforts will be less sustainable. Um, I, I am afraid that you know, the provincial early years office could be you know done away with the stroke of a pen and we'll have a provincial office for something different that will you know so really trying to think about those pieces together and and one of the pieces that um, you know I have thought a lot about from a systems perspective is this whole idea that relationships are such a key driver of effective systems work but when you don't actually live and work with people in the regional and provincial structures every day, how do you create those relationships? Because all they're bringing to the community is, is policy and there's no sort of interpersonal presence um, around that. So uh, that's just a really big question for me. So thanks to a conversation I had with Pippa last week, I put together some of these um, system drivers ideas and you know, it's basically exactly what Brenda and Alan and John were ta already talking about. But the key piece, I think, for me is this whole idea around time and how that underlies all of those other components of the system. So I really uh, am spending at least a half day a week. So I'm the executive director of a big multi-service organization. We are the host agency. Um, for the early year center contract by piecing together different little pots of money and programs uh, working with the success by six coordinator i now have 
five people that are kind of a team of people that are working on this process. But we meet together uh, at least a half a day every week. And then they put a whole bunch of other time in. And I think that that's the part that is never properly recognized um, when you're talking about systems change, that the time spent and the intensity of the contacts and um, that the, you know, the over time, the duration of those, uh, that commitment, and that people dedicate time outside of meetings. Uh, historically, in British Columbia, the main of that work would be done by the coordinator um, and not have a, a, a leadership team to be working with. Relationships, and these are just some of the things that, um, you know, we've already touched on, certainly in terms of the important um, characteristics of those relationships. I think we also have to acknowledge, especially in some smaller towns, that there are, there are relationships, but they're not that functional. So you can have relationships that have met a whole bunch of these benchmarks, but in fact are not moving um, you in the direction. And I've, I've been thinking about those things in terms of the whole ideas around early brain development and that notion of um, you know, synaptic connections. And we have some pretty strong synaptic connections um, in our community that aren't necessarily in the interest of, uh, of the broader work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, leadership, and again, we've talked about this, but I, I've really been trying to get my head around this notion that the leaders in the early childhood world have not been organizational leaders. Um, and that how we integrate their knowledge um, and build from that, and how we build the heart in some of the organizational decision makers. Um, that it hasn't necessarily been their passion. Good, Barry. So what, an organizational leader, is that sort of like um, a quarterback of a football team? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, in, this specific, in this specific reference, the organizational leaders that are key in the early childhood world are the Ministry for Children and Family Development, Public Health, and the school district. So those are the people that you really want to make sure are around the table. And executive directors of nonprofits. They're sort of the organizational <coughs> leaders. So the UIC coordinator wouldn't need to be so much of an organizational leader? No. Oh, okay. No, and I think that that's some, the way that we have kind of gotten off track in some ways in BC is that the coordinators have been leading and without any organizational levers, you can only lead so far, okay. right? I'm thinking of it a different sense. Uh, go ahead. So, Joanne, so you're talking about these as lead organizations. You're talking about the formal leadership. Yeah. A lot of the literature on this talks about the need for champions. Yes. Passionate commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in your mind? Well, yeah, thanks for bringing that up because it is. Um, Something that I've been thinking about that, you know, when we look at some of the more successful, if you like, communities in BC around early childhood, you'll see what I think of as almost like charismatic leaders, but champions is another way to think about it. And whether or not that is an essential component, um, it, it kind of, um, I don't want it to be. Maybe, but maybe the literature is telling us that it is. Like, I, I think about it as the Ann Cooper effect. And the Ann, Co Ann Cooper is the superintendent of schools in Revelstoke. And Revelstoke has been the place that has had the lowest child vulnerability uh, forever. And, and there's lots of things that can be pointed to in the community around her specific charismatic leadership that have probably made a difference. But what about those communities that, for whatever reason, don't have that that kind of leadership, how do you nurture it? How do you replicate it? So I'm, I'm thinking of it more functionally. So yeah. that Singe, for example, talks about the need for three kinds of leadership in mm -hmm. an organization. You need to have somebody at the executive level who's going to be the champion, mm -hmm. who's going to bless us, who's going to mm -hmm. protect and take it forward. 
you need a coordinator function, somebody who's going to be responsible for trying to keep all the pieces moving. Mm -hmm. And then you need frontline leadership. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum, what I don't hear you talking about, and what I think you need is somebody on the executive team of these lead organizations who says, I'll, I'll carry this role. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I've been doing some of that, but I think that my hope would be that that could be more of a shared responsibility. But yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Do somebody else have their hand up on Go ahead. No, if you're... just based on my experience, I mean, I think it's not just having that, that key leader at each of the organizations, but then having a supportive coordinator within each of those organizations mm -hmm. as well that can help support that work. So mm -hmm. if you are asking for more distributed leadership, then there needs to be some dedicated capacity within each of those mm -hmm. organizations to make that happen. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the big barriers for sure. Yeah. Go on. You mentioned the rebels, for example, and the Anne Cooper impact. What I found really interesting is that um, she and a couple of others said that it, usen't, uh, it didn't use to be uh, that way. I mean, we have been collecting EDI results for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, but they say 20, 25 years ago, a generation ago, it wasn't really a place for families to end. So I think what, what I'm getting at is it's important to tell the change over time story mm -hmm. and to what extent trans, you know, the leadership and other aspects were part of that. Because often we hear that people are tired of hearing Revelstoke being the poster child. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't get that part of the story told that it wasn't wasn't always that's that right. way it changed and what went into that change I think is uh, interesting to find out which is of course what some of the work that Brendan and about others are doing is. yeah and, and back in way one the first way of EDI in the province of Revelstoke was just average mm -hmm. it wasn't yes. the best yes so, okay well, the Comox Valley has 40% childhood vulnerability now, so we have a we have a chance to map the change. <laughs> Talked a lot about this and having some of those pillars and touchstones to come um, back to, and I think that we we've, we've really done some uh, quite good work on that. And then just to touch briefly on some of the structures and processes that we've put into place, um, some formal partnership agreements to allow for the satellite network to exist. Really liked what you said, Alan, about the 10-year memorandum of understanding. <laughs> so I'm going to take that one back home. Have the strategic plan. We've had the um, common training, which we've continued to renew a little bit because you know people turn over and those kinds of things. We have a new mechanism for allocating funding. Um, we hope to have, in partnership with the Human Learning Partnership, a great evaluation, and um, continuing to work on the need for some integrated policies. We, we're kind of toying with this common intake process, but it's it's complicated, but we have developed a, a simple sort of shared referral across the network of early year satellites in the community. Um, really looking at some innovative um, service delivery models. Uh, so we have a new approach that we're calling pop-up family resource programs um, to do in our malls and various places like that around the community. Really trying to get at those families that uh, are choosing not to access services for a whole host of reasons. And I put institutional support, although uh, we don't have as much as we would we would like. I would really love it. My dream is, is a, that within each of those organizations that we've identified as key partners, that there be a requirement for those people to, in their job descriptions, to be part of the um, collaborative work because it's still way too easy for that to be um, deprioritized given all of the things that people are are facing. But I, you know, I was at a meeting yesterday up at in Fort St. John and um, I think we also have to challenge the way people think about it because um, you know, a couple of people around the table, one from the school system, one from a nonprofit said, you know, as a senior person, I just can't take part. I've just got too many things on my plate. I just can't take part. And I think we have to call people on that too because that you're making choices every day about how you're spending your time. And um, so I think there's more of an opportunity to take part than sometimes people um, um, agree to. So anyways. 
Go ahead. Can I just ask you to elaborate just a tiny bit on the process of mechanism for allocating funding? Because it seems to me that's one of the ways that the power relationships might be reproduced in the new system. Yes, so that is just, uh, I touched a little bit on it in terms of this pot of money that we're calling the Community Early Years Fund. It's hosted by the school district. Um, we're, uh, we're putting a, an agreement in place that will sort of be the, the guiding principles for that fund so that would protect it from any other use within the school district because there were some people in the community that were concerned if we put those funds into the school district that they could get lost on you know grade 12 or something um, so that they'll, they'll be protected and then we have a um, funding committee of the leadership team who will make recommendations to the broader leadership team about how those funds will be spent to meet um, the strategic priorities. And some of it should be fairly straightforward because the strategic priorities are quite detailed in terms of the kinds of things that we've agreed we're trying to achieve. So uh, it's it's early days, but I'm I'm feeling optimistic about that. <laughs> Go ahead, Joseph. Joanne, is the, is the vision to have influence over, um, I guess, funding priorities of uh, the health and, and the Ministry of Children and Family Development, and is there a pathway forward for, for trying to have, I guess, local regional influence over those funding streams? My, yes, and the only pathway at this point is to hopefully be able to demonstrate that we're effective with these smaller pots of money because it's that's a fairly significant systemic change um, but you know the responsibility for managing the contracts for MCFD for an example is pretty close to home and within our community so and and that person is very much on side for this for these endeavors so it would be nice to test it and, you know I always think because within uh, government, there's so much um, lauding of collaborative practice and all of those kinds of things that you want to push and say, okay, we're ready to give it, to really give it a go um, and see if they can be responsive to that. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking about the First Nations uh, around your community mm -hmm. and also I think urban is quite a few Aboriginal families that are living from different parts of the mm -hmm. province mm -hmm. in your area, and how you feel that these changes are potentially going to benefit, or are they engaging in the process, or are they still within that council, or how? They're that they're out? very much engaged in the process. So the council for Aboriginal Early Child <coughs> Development is meeting, continuing to meet separately, uh, but then they have a variety of representatives. Um, that also are on the leadership table. So there's an intersect there. There are some funds in the community that are dedicated to services for Aboriginal children, and those are not within the community early years pot. So they'll still be managed and allocated because they have been by the Aboriginal Council quite effectively for a few years. Um, but there's certainly... Um, a recognition and our Aboriginal Council just hosted because they had some funds available a broad uh, community early years forum to you know talk about the strategic plan and all those kinds of things so um, it's our Aboriginal community for the most part is very integrated into our community it's a fairly small community we don't have you know remote reserves um, those kinds of things so that uh, service access um, is really not distinct. Aboriginal kids are accessing most of the same services that mainstream kids are. And so there's a real recognition in the Aboriginal Council that we need to be planning mm -hmm. together. So. And do you have First Nations leadership buy-in? Not as much as we would want. There is, you know, representation from the band. Um, the idea of the council right now, the ECD council, is that they're looking at uh, joining with our Aboriginal Education Council, which is a, a mandated structure in the education system to allow for the participation of all of the Aboriginal organizations and nations. So by doing that, then that 
that gives the ECD council uh, more more infrastructure and more buy-in from the the local nation. I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> is that, that's no more that. Oh, 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 this is oh. just. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> about what knits these presentations together with a question that's really been percolating in my mind. Um, and it's about the whole idea of leadership and the discussion you're beginning to have about layers of leadership. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about as the, our research here has emerged is this idea of levers and the fact that different people within our system have their hands on different levers that allow them to be participants in the change. Um, and so instead of thinking of leaders at levels of organizations, thinking about what they can bring to the idea of change, for me it, is a bit, it, it sort of transforms my thinking about who should be there and why they should be there. And I wonder if you could just each reflect a little on, from the perspective of the work that you've been doing, how that might play into some of the, the, the thinking you've been doing. That's really cool. I don't think anybody's talking about that very much. And it's, it is really important. So the first thing that came to my mind is if, if we took things like the concept map, which kind of lays out the pieces in the puzzle, and thought through what are the dynamic relationships amongst that, what are the key functions that tie those different pieces together, then we could start to have a conversation about, well, which organization, which person is in the best position to take the lead on that kind of a role. And we could start to kind of develop a bit of a coordination plan, if you will, for the distributed leadership we're talking about. I've not seen that talked about anywhere. That's really interesting and I think really powerful. Yeah. I. I I, I think it would be very exciting to look at that and to look, as you say, at the different characteristics and contributions of, of the different leaders. So I, I made reference to, you know, thinking about task-specific leadership or integrated leadership. And so there's so many aspects of it to look at. And when we think about what we're doing, it's that distributed leadership within each of the organizations involved with the collaborative and then it's like how do you identify the distributed leadership mm -hmm. amongst the collaborative as well so mm -hmm. it's it's coming in from all of those angles i think we do that kind of thing informally more than we probably realize I was, again just thinking as we've been talking uh we had a strategic planning retreat for our group a little while ago and have identified leadership roles within our own team for who's going to move things forward. So John's got community-based primary care, for example. Um, I take tools. Carol Herbert is connecting the dots because she does so many things with different organizations. You can kind of see the patterns. But what we're really doing is starting to think about who's in the best position within our team to move things along. And uh, the other role they stuck me with is the, the hub role. So somebody's got to be trying to hear what all those different people are doing and what the different functions are and how they relate. <laughs> John wants to have a conversation with the deputy minister about where to go next with Langley. I'm saying, well, that's cool, but we probably need to weave it in with other conversations we need to have with the ministry. So it's that kind of orchestration function mm -hmm. that's really critical. Or else they're leadership. leading off in all directions. So yeah. very tricky, but very important question. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing that came to mind when you were talking about this was about the network that's emerging and, and the emergence of what leadership looks like. And I find what's really interesting in the, the work that this research is that um, there's sort of an emerging organization to how and structure to what leadership is looking like. But when you actually talk to the different members about what leadership is or who, who composes the leadership, and we're getting different responses. And so I find it I find it interesting in that the data are going to be telling us some of the qualities that are emerging about 
this what seems like distributed leadership in this case, and some of the things that sort of fit with that. Um, but then when we hear the participants themselves talking about that, and they identify whether a leader is one person or whether a leader is four people, um, we're finding sort of different definitions and conceptualizations of it. So I think pairing the two will be very interesting. Right. I have a question that relates to uh, I think it was briefly mentioned. Um, about the social determinants of health and the inequity and poverty and distribution of resources. So I think from hearing all your talks, I'm getting a sense, okay, once we have money and resources within the system, I can see how you think about channeling those into common visions with distributed leadership and so forth. But how does that relate to potentially, and that's part of the question or maybe, maybe a provocative statement, isn't the bigger problem to channel money from other places in society into this sector? And so it's not so much, we can only play with so much with an education health. Well, sorry, probably for primarily early childcare, sorry, so we should early childhood education, not so much health. Um, but isn't the bigger issue of how do we get our society to think about how we channel resources to things that we think are and how does that play into uh, the bigger political process? I know it's a big question, but I, I hear all of this and say, how do we then scrape for the additional things and funding and resources that we need to make all that kind of work maybe a bit easier and more effective? Well, I think this is, this is a Russian doll's conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're living within this larger context, and how are we going to dance with it? Um, I'd encourage all of us to give a lot of thought to what the change in federal government might mean for this. We'll see. But they've explicitly flagged determinants of health as a strategic priority. They know that it's going to have to be done collaboratively between the federal government and the provincial governments. Um, we've sent the uh, new prime minister a briefing note saying, look, you really need to have a first minister's conference that focuses on these things, and these are some of the top issues that those folks should be talking about. The fundamental problem I think you're talking about, and it's been a problem for 50 years, it wasn't adequately addressed when we first came up with the Canada Health Act, is that it means a reallocation of resources away from hospitals to the community and away from primarily physicians to more interprofessional teams. And those two are so fundamental. But I think you're right that it's, it's only if all levels of government start to take seriously the reality that some of the money is going to have to come out of hospitals. That's all there is to it. If we want to move in the directions we meet, and that, that's going to be the make or break thing we'll see about over the next few years. Can I just add something there? I think the other problem, too, is that um, um, is when we look at early childhood intervention for families that experience social marginalization and structural forms of violence, is that we separate children's health from family well-being. Mm -hmm. And we focus on the early years and we focus on early childhood development. But in fact, you cannot separate maternal health or family well-being and the impact of social determinants on family well-being on their children's health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so that when we look at early intervention in that context, it needs to address mm -hmm. the impact of social determinants on the family as a whole. And then we look at children's development, because that's a luxury. Because you need to look at food, housing, security, basic access and navigation through some key services in society before you can even attend to a child's speech development or, or schooling. So I think we need to sort of really broaden and, and, and not forget that we can't separate the child from the family and the family from the community. Uh, you're singing my song now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to dance too? <laughs> so, but, but another perspective that I seem to be obsessed with at the moment is the other thing that's happening is that it is an incredible concentration of wealth that's controlling political decision making. So we have suffered under a neoliberal political culture for the last mm -hmm. couple of decades, which has taken money out of families, taken Increased poverty, and so you know we're, we're battling against a stream that's deteriorating and making the welfare of children worse. So the, uh, this is this is good news that we've got a government that at least 
moving in the right direction, but it, it remains to be seen. We're going to have to keep fighting to resist this concentration of wealth to get a redistribution of wealth to the poor. Agreed on all fronts, um, but and you know certainly that is something that the Human Early Learning Partnership and others have been, you know, advocating and trying to find strategies for for many years. Um, I just want to add though that I do think there it can be some effect for communities to be speaking with one voice um, towards us, and so that some of this local collaborative work can in fact. Um, move the dial on that a bit because communities have been traditionally quite competitive at times not and, and lobbying for different things and all of that. So I think that if we can continue to do that effective community collaborative work, it actually has a, an opportunity to influence in the bigger picture as well. Yeah. Um, so on that point, we're seeing lots of successes for the community integration coordination model at, small, at the level of smaller communities. In a city like Vancouver, which is so diverse and in such um, strong neighborhoods and an incredibly uh, rich number of organizations that are incredibly sophisticated, um, how do you successfully create a collaborative model in a city like Vancouver? Um, just something that we're seeing very difficult. And just, well, a another massive fundamental challenge that you're putting your finger on that doesn't get enough attention. One of the things that I've been struck by in the last couple of years is the extent to which the health sector doesn't talk to the community development sector. Um, so that, in fact, there's a long, strong tradition around the question you're raising about how do you engage communities. Um, Al McAllister did some really nice work in the 70s around neighborhood development, neighborhood language. Which is probably right, that you need to have, at least conceptually, uh, a focus on the neighborhood. It's where the real energy is going to come from. And then the question is, how do we orchestrate all that? Uh, I'm on the Western Residents Association now. For in West, we live in West Vancouver. And it's, this stretches all the way from Horseshoe Bay to the Eagle Ridge Harbor, which must be, I don't know, Maybe, maybe a few hundred households, <laughs> but it's, they're getting really engaged about what happens when you cancel bus service and what happens when you, you know. So that I, my guess is that, in fact, that's what's necessary. It doesn't take much money. It doesn't take much formal structure to mobilize that, but it does take coordination, and that's the challenge. Yeah. And I think, too, that um, I, I really recognize the differences between the different uh, kinds of communities in BC, but if you actually think about all of the agents that are involved, they can probably be clustered into very similar kinds of groupings, and I think that that's the challenge to go back to 